Good. Well, welcome back. May I invite everyone to take their seats? Matt Thurlow is so excited about the time change tomorrow night that he's starting to rob a few minutes a bit, a bit early. So we'll be ahead of schedule, and that, that leaves you um, extra time during our lunch break. Our final speaker of the morning is Katie Hall Burleson, who is chief curator of the Herman Grima and Gallier Historic Houses, two of the wonderful, wonderful uh, house museums here that we will have a chance to enjoy. Katie grew up in Mobile, Alabama. She received her BA from the University of Virginia and an MA in the History of the Decorative Arts, Design, and Culture from the Bard Graduate Center in 2006. Before taking her current position, Katie was decorative arts curator at the Louisiana State Museum for eight years. She's curated or co-curated several exhibits, including The Palm, The Pine, and The Cypress, Newcomb Pottery of New Orleans, Death and Mourning in 19th Century New Orleans, and Pierre-Joseph Landry, Patriot, Planter, Sculptor. She has presented and published papers on relatively unknown New Orleans artist and collector, Mary Bella Pro you say Prague? Pro Prague, thank you, Bryce, and much further afield on neoclassical taste in Louisiana, 1790 to 1840 at the Museum of Decorative Arts of the Indian Ocean on Reunion Island. Today, her lecture is Preserving a Family Legacy Art and Architecture at the Herman Grima House. Please welcome Katie. Good after, good morning, everybody. So I've attended lots of lectures in here, mostly at the Antiques Forum, but this is my first time on this, behind this podium, so I'm very excited. Thanks, Matt, for inviting me and the Decorative Arts Trust and for the collection for hosting us today. So I called my talk Preserving a Family Legacy because, um, and it's actually legacies because we've got the Herman family, the Grima family, and also the uh, Christian, we were the home of the Christian Women's Exchange who still, um, who still operate our museums today. Um, so as Matt said, I'm the curator there. I've been there for a couple of years and still I'm getting a, a grasp on all of the, uh, the family history. So in addition to just the decorative arts, uh, we interpret the family's history and um, and also the enslaved people who lived in the house. So today I'm going to highlight some of the architectural elements of the house, compare it to other examples from the period, and also introduce you to the Hermans, the Grimas, and of course some of their objects and paintings, and the Women's Exchange. Um, our staff is is charged with preserving and interpreting the legacy of not only the families and the enslaved workers who lived in the house and the outbuildings, but the women and men who gave their time and money to open the house to the public. Since you'll be touring the house this afternoon, my goal is to give you the context in which to appreciate the objects in our collection and the buildings that house them. So first, I'll give you a little background on the property and its ownership. So uh, the Herman Grima House was built in 1831 by Virginia native William Brand for wealthy commodities broker Samuel Herman, his wife, and their children. Samuel Herman was born in Germany and immigrated to Louisiana along the German coast, which is, uh, he was settled near Edgard Vacherie. I'm not sure if that was in y'all's, uh, your visits yesterday, but he came there in 1804. He and his uh, wealthy widow, Emerant Becknell Brew, married in 1806, and the couple had four children. They moved to New Orleans in 1813 or 1814, and then purchased this property in 1823. So the house that was there before, um, uh, Anne already showed you the, uh, the houses that were built on Colombage. So the house in the, in the um, transfer property chain of title says that the house on the land was on Colombage before, so we assume that they tore that down to build this property. He resided here with his family until 1844 when he was forced to sell it due to financial hardships after the Panic of 1837, which Lydia referenced. And actually, the Hermans 
he himself is blamed in a lot of the newspapers for starting the Panic of 1837. So I don't know. I don't want to take all that responsibility, though. So local judge and notary Felix Grima purchased the property in 1844, and he retained control of the, the Grima family retained control of the house until 1921 when it was purchased by the SPCA, which was kind of an interesting little three-year period because they were planning on having their headquarters, Louisiana headquarters here at the Herman Grima house, but we're glad that they didn't. And in 1924, they sold the building to the Christian Women's Exchange, uh, which was a, a charitable organization that was the idea of women helping women, um, like some of the other organizations now, Junior League, other things like that. Um, so they purchased it for $17,500, and it, the Christian Women's Exchange became the Women's Exchange in 1999 and ran the Herman Grima House as a boarding house for unmarried working women from 1924 until 1971, when the organization's mission shifted from charity to preservation and education. The house opened partially as a museum in 1971, but the room rental program lasted until 1975. So between 1971 and 1975, it was a museum, but there were still people renting rooms upstairs and out in the slave quarters. So that was probably a pretty interesting time. <laughs> so this, is, uh, this plan shows New Orleans in 1815, around the time that the Hermans moved to New Orleans. As you can see, our house is located near the center of the French Quarter on St. Louis between Bourbon and Dauphine. Uh, unfortunately, today when you go over there, you will have to cross Bourbon, which provide, presents some challenges to us as a museum, but we can't really move the house any closer. So, so here's a little uh, a map of the Sanborn insurance map from 18, April 1876. This is a square, and I've highlighted the, um, the, the outline of the property. And at the time, it was not divided. Where that dotted line is, it was, they owned actually the whole, uh, going all the way down to Conti Street. Um, and, then, and then in 1896, you'll notice some differences. In the 1876 plan, it was 96 St. Louis, and now it's 820. So in the early 1890s, all of the addresses were changed. There was a whole new map drawn up. And, um, and also the enslaved quarters and the workrooms, our outbuilding was labeled as tenements in 1896. So I um, have to do some more research on that and figure out maybe who might have been living there. But they must have been renting them as tenements between the 1876 and 1896. And uh, we do have an 1880 inventory of the house that Marie Grima did that suggests that at the time, three of the Grima sons had bedrooms in the outbuildings, although they were in their 40s and 50s. So, so the builder hired to erect the two main buildings at 820 St. Louis was William Brand. He was born in 17, around 1780 in Virginia. In 1805, he's listed as a bricklayer and builder on Gravier Street. 1811 as an architect on magazine, and then 1822 as a builder on magazine. Uh, we have at least 43 building contracts from 1805 to 1837. Uh, thank you to a paper actually that was done in 2002 for Anne Masson's class on historic preservation at Tulane. Uh, a woman named D Doreen Dennis Babo did a paper on brand and she went to the notarial archives and pulled all the contracts that were there and made a wonderful chart that has the prices, the parties involved, what work they were hired to do, and um, the materials. So that was a wealth of information for me. Um, let's see. So most of the 43 buildings were constructed of brick from Philadelphia or labeled as country brick or lake brick, and there were a few from uh, Baltimore brick. So he had relationships with John James Audubon, Benjamin Henry Latrobe, and uh, Andrew Jackson. 
So he wrote, Brand wrote Jackson a letter thanking him for helping his son with a naval appointment. Uh, John James Audubon, he actually uh, tutored, Audubon tutored Brand's second wife who needed some culture uh, in uh, French and painting. And then his wife also, his wife Lucy Audubon, the Audubons were having some financial struggles because painting didn't, uh, the painting and the artistry that he was doing at the time wasn't bringing him in a lot of money. So she went and was a nurse for the Brand children. So they actually lived in the home for a little bit. So Benjamin Henry Latrobe, who we've mentioned a couple of times this morning, he wrote in his journal of New Orleans in 1819, an American bricklayer, a very worthy man, consulted me as to a house he had built for himself on the London plan. I objected to many parts of his design as contrary to every principle of good architecture. <laughs> so that it's been suggested a couple of places that this could have been William Brand, and we know we don't think that he was trained as an architect, so, um, and he built his own house in 1810 uh, around on magazine between Poydras and Natchez. So I think he improved his skills after that and, uh, and when he built the Herman Grima house. So, and his home was destroyed in the early 20th century. And Audubon called him in his journals the wealthy builder and his wife the rich Mrs. Brand. So. <laughs> He's definitely a, a, had a good income. So we have, of the 43 buildings for which we have contracts, uh, I'm gonna just highlight a few here. So one is the 1810 St. Philip Theater, and that's pictured right. Uh, this is a detail from that map that I showed you from 1815. So uh, this, ex this building now, if you're walking down to Gallier House on Sunday, you'll pass a school on the left at the corner of St. Philip and Royal and that's where this building was. So he was listed as the builder and Latour was the architect. And the contract was to construct a vast and airy theater, more grand and attractive with balcony seating. And it was also in, with a Philadelphia brick front. In 1817, he did the Orleans Ballroom next to the Orleans Theater. The Orleans Theater does not exist anymore, but the ballroom does and that's the site of the current uh, Bourbon Orleans Hotel. So that's right behind the cathedral. And his job in that uh, was bricklaying and plastering the ballroom. In 1819, he did the first Presbyterian church, and that was in the plain Gothic style, and it was also brick. That building, that church was later called uh, Clapp's Church. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the fairly famous Reverend Clapp from the period, but. Uh, and then the 1822 was 520 Royal, the building that Lydia referenced and the, the collection is currently renovating for their uh, new exhibition space. And so he was, he was hired to do the rear addition parallel to the kitchens in the back and improvements to the courtyard area of the residence for $5,150. So another building, he also did houses for notable citizens, including John Noel Destrahan and Joseph Soniat du Fawcett. This is the building right next door to where we are now. It's uh, where they have it's the Laura Simon Nelson galleries. Yes, next door. It's painted red, but I found this picture from when it was being renovated in 2011, and it was originally, you know, brick underneath, obviously. So um, I like the picture showing when the when the paint is off. So in the contract, it includes uh, pine floors, a slate roof, doors are four feet wide, and they have fan lights, which you'll find all over the city, and windows with iron grates. So this is also known as the Destrahan Periliot House. Let's see. So I just wanted to show you all a couple of, um, well, I'm not gonna have time to go really detailed in the architecture, but just found a few images that kind of, they, they struck me, the details of the doorways are really similar to the Herman Grima house. And one of these, and I realized afterwards I spelled Pierce wrong, that is P-E-I-R-C-E. -E. And uh, I just visited Portsmouth for the first time a couple weeks ago and fell in love with the place, so I wanted to put a little bit of it in there. But this is uh, very similar to the door at the Herman Grima house. Um, so it's likely Brand did not have any architectural training, but probably just learned from his bricklaying jobs and had copies 
of some of the architectural treatises and pattern books of uh, like Asher Benjamin and Menard Lefevre's. Lefevre was a contemporary, Asher Benjamin was a little bit earlier, so it was likely he was looking more at Benjamin's work. But some of the elements of the Herman Grima House, which we generally describe as federal or late Georgian, uh, are in line with what you might find in Virginia or New England. The house on the right is, was in Alexandria, Virginia, and now it's in Princeton. It's the home of the Princeton Day School. Um, and so I just really like this drawing because it, they pointed out the elements of the, um, of the architecture. Um, let's see, so they also, these, this house also has a five bay design. It's in brick, it's got the, the Venetian, both of these have the Venetian side lights framed by columns or pilasters, an elliptical fan light above the door, and topped by an arch with a keystone. So these all kind of fall within the federal framework. And you also see the influence of uh, Robert Adam here as well, with the, the delicate uh, glass um, fan light above the door. So this built, the Pierce Mansion is now owned by a church in Portsmouth, but you can still walk by and see it. Um, here are a few others. So those were 1790s, and here just a couple of contemporary, a little bit before the Herman Grima House. The Davenport House in Savannah, which is also a five-bay brick home with the arch and the fan light and the, the Venetian side lights, um, similar also to a little bit earlier, but Drayton Hall and some of those other ones in, um, up the East Coast. Now on the right is Benjamin Henry, Henry Latrobe's design or building for the Louisiana State Bank. That was designed in 1820, but Latrobe died before it was completed in 1822. So this is what you might have seen in, um, you would have seen in New Orleans in the 1820s before the Herman Grima House was built. Now, in that con, we also know that that, house, that building cost 55,000 to build. And, and maybe it was, there's an interior dome, so I think that's one of the reasons it might have been so expensive. Or if you compare it to our house, uh, Samuel Herman was required to pay for a lot of the extra, supply a lot of the extra materials, the stone and the uh, marble, granite. So, so this is the Herman Grima house here as a, the contract in uh, February 16th, 1831. Um, was for a brick, two-story brick dwelling house, $15,205, which if you compare that to the building we just saw, that seems like not a lot of money at all. So I haven't actually gone in and seen if there were lawsuits afterwards about, because when I worked at the State Museum, the Pontalba buildings, there were lots of lawsuits afterwards trying to get more money and the Baroness wanting to get more work out of the architect. And, uh, so you come across those a lot. So I'm wondering if maybe they ended up paying more in the end than just this, the 15,000 for the contract. Then a month later, they did a contract for a three-story brick house on the back part of the lot of ground for 5,000. And these are, I'm giving you the dimensions here. Now, our building now includes a, or our property now includes a stable, another courtyard to the left of that where I'll be giving you all an introduction this afternoon. And then we have a carriage house and stables as well. So those were added in 1850 by the Grimas. So in the contract we have, um, like I said, for Herman was required to furnish a lot of the materials, including the steps, sills, heads of doors and windows, the stone casing in front, iron jams, and all other stone or marble used. So we had to furnish all of those, so that could have added to the cost um, outside of the contract. The contract specifies three good coats of plaster, and the parlor, dining room, and passage are to have a plain, neat stucco cornice and a neat centerpiece. The roof is to have the best English or Welsh slate. There are to be four copper gutters, which thankfully ours have not been stolen like lots of other ones around town. Uh, all windows on the upper story are to have Venetian blinds. So we don't right now, but that is one of my, on my wish list to get uh, some Venetian blinds up there. Um, and all of the inside doors and woodwork is of seasoned white pine and outside is seasoned cypress. Uh, let's see. And so the outbuilding, this building, the three-story one uh, in the back, overlooks our courtyard, which you'll get to visit today, and I didn't, I didn't show any pictures of that, but it's one of our 
uh, highlights on our tour. So that includes a wine room. I'm going from right to left, a wine room, a scullery for washing dishes, a hearth kitchen where we do cooking demonstrations uh, in the fall to the spring on Thursdays, and then an ironing room and a staircase. And the two, uh, two floors above were div also divided into four rooms each and a staircase, and those were the housing for the enslaved workers on the property. They had anywhere from eight to, I think 18 was the, the highest number at one time that they had living there. So um, the kitchen fireplace is to be cased with fire brick and hearth laid with the same. There are to be an oven and stew holes, fireplace and kettle in the washroom, a crane fixed in the fireplace of the kitchen, which we still have the original iron crane that comes out. And then each of the servants' rooms had small fireplaces as well. And the wine cellar was to be shelved with holes. So it's a pretty large room. They were, they were definitely drinking maybe some of Senor A's wine. <laughs> um, so the foundation, the main house, the foundation of the inner walls was to be four bricks thick and at the bottom, and then it went up to two bricks thick and then one and a half bricks thick. So they sloped it off on the side. And uh, let's see, so the, in the distance, three feet of granite from the, from the ground to the floor of the first floor. Let's see. Oh, and just to mention, that, so in, in the building contract, we have the materials are Philadelphia or Baltimore brick, uh, Welsh or English slate, copper, cypress, pine, and mahogany. So the handrails were mahogany, which you will see that today too. And here's two images of the front entrance. The one on the left is from 1907. An art magazine did a story on us and the Collins Debal Viocare survey on the collections website has got lots of these images and that's where I got this one. So there are lots of details in the contract about the door. They spend a lot of time on that. So um, it was obviously a very important uh, element of the design and it's, it's more embellished than most of the, the rest of the exterior. So in 1907, it was wood stained, and then sometime before 1963, it was painted white. Um, and that's where this photograph on the right is from the, when the Historic American Building Survey came and visited and took pictures. So <clears throat> the plan of the house is of an American origin, having a central hall extending through the house with rooms on each side and a gracefully curving staircase ascending from the back of the hall. Its only concession to the French tradition is this gallery across the rear. You can see um, on the right, those are, the middle one is looking from the courtyard up to the back of the house. And then the one on the far right is looking from inside the first floor gallery out towards the garden. Now the glass, the door, it wasn't, the arches weren't glassed in and doors weren't put in until, I think it was the 1850s. We don't have an exact, um, we don't have the, the documentation for that, but the original design did not call for that. The contract did not call for that being uh, glassed in. So I was looking at some, um, this uh, Robert Adam, talking about him again, was it kind of, the inside of the back gallery kind of looks like a, it has a greenhouse effect or like a sunroom effect. We, uh, I know that they lived a lot out there. They use that as, a, as an extra living space. And we have an oral history from one of the, the Grima's grandchildren who lived there for a little bit in the early, probably around 1907. And she said that her aunts, who were the Marie and Louise Grima, that would only let her speak French. And they also had griots and grits out on the, the back porch out here every Sunday. So one day I'll recreate that for a program. Um, so another thing that Latrobe had said in his journal from 1819, he said, wherever Americans build, they exhibit their flat brick fronts with a sufficient number of holes for light and entrance. The only French circumstances which they retain, French circumstance they retain, is the balcony of the upper story, which, although generally too elevated for the protection of the passenger, is still a means of shade. So as Anne mentioned, these still protect us. And we learn 
in the winter time we get on the sunny side of the street and in the summertime we try to get on the shady side of the street here when we're walking around the corridor so it still does that for us and uh, the French he also said the French stucco the fronts of their buildings and often color them but the Americans exhibit their red steering brickwork oh these are the sorry I forgot to mention the the cabinet are also I think Anne showed y'all a floor plan of uh, the French layout and this is one of the the French elements of the house is having these cabinets at the end and uh, they still in the 1880 inventory Marie does call them cabinets and uh, and it seemed like they were using them for closets or dressing rooms uh, according to what furniture they had there so so it's got a federal kind of it's overall a federal late Georgian but then you have these Creole adaptations So we also have some faux finishes. This, the door I'm showing you actually isn't the best of our, of our um, wood graining. The, we made them come back and do it a couple, again a couple times this last time. But um, you'll see in paintings of the time that there are this uh, faux graining of the doors was really popular. And I'm sorry I couldn't get better images of these, but this is a, a George Harvey image of Harvey Schuyler Ogden and his sister, and you see in the back their, their door is faux grained, and then also this image from a girl coming through a doorway, um, both roughly about 10 years later than after the Herman Grima house was built. Now, this is one of my favorite, my favorite absolutely, without a doubt actually, is the parlor and dining room freeze. So this is, uh, this is the entrance, the doors between the parlor and the dining room, and we've got this wonderful carved wood freeze one side is the, the parlor side is garlands and flowers and patarai, and then the, the dining room side is uh, cornucopia and fruit and flowers also. And so it kind of, it's that reflecting, you know, the use of the room and the decorative motifs. Now this is another image on the left from that 1907 article. So this would have been when the Grima family was still living there, but it looks nothing like this. We definitely do not have the sconces um, nailed into the columns like they did and, or any real plants inside. So. so these are kind of, there's, there's several of the design books at the time that had these sliding doors with the frieze above. And I'm sorry, these images aren't very uh, dark, but this was just right after right after Brand, but there were some that were uh, before that he could have looked to, but you see the columns um, encasing the doors and they were slotted. The columns were completely round, but they were slotted in the middle to allow the doors to open and close. So now we'll talk about some of the fine and decorative arts in the house. I really, Anne had, had a, issue I know with cutting hers down to 45 minutes with 300 years of architecture but I also feel like I want to tell y'all everything about the Herman Green house so it was hard for me to cut things down to 45 minutes as well but you'll see most of it this afternoon uh, so I'll give you a little bit of background and some details on these portraits these are uh, we do have an exceptional collection of family portraits of the Hermans and the Grimas uh, they're most, they're, most of them are by the two preeminent portraitists in the mid-19th century New Orleans, one being Jean-Joseph Vaudechamp and the other one being Jacques Amans. So we had, the Hermans had their, photo, the, their portraits mostly done by Vaudechamp. Here on the left is Virginie Herman. She's the youngest of the Herman children and the only one that was born in New Orleans. And she was about 16 at the time this portrait was done. And it was right before, right after they had moved into the house. And her brother Lucian, who's a, you know, a handsome guy, <laughs> he, uh, he's a, a year later and he was, uh, he was, yes, sorry. She was doing this around her debut time. So this was kind of like her coming out to uh, anybody who came through the house and saw this beautiful portrait. She had a lot of suitors, one of them being um, in the counting house last night, I saw his portrait, was Carl Cohn. And he was one of, he wrote in some of his letters that 
She gave him the cold shoulder. He wanted to do a duet with her, but she gave him the cold shoulder. She ended up marrying a, a Joseph Urson Landro. Uh, that was her first husband. He unfortunately was killed in a train accident, but but he was the he was the half brother of Jacques Amand's wife. So we've actually the Hermans have a connection with having their portraits painted by Vaudechamp, and then they have a family connection to Jacques Amand's. So they had them both kind of at their, at their fingertips. And uh, we have a portrait of Joseph Ursin Landro in the collection, and we think we attribute it to Jacques Amans, even though it's not signed by him. So, and also Landro's father, is, his portrait by Amans is in the collection of Noma. So they were. Um, and these are two of the Grima family portraits. This is Felix's wife, uh, Marie Sophie Adelaide Montague Grima. She is, if you've seen the Montague family portrait in the, um, in the Salazar exhibit, I think Sabelle's going to talk about it on Sunday. That's her family. And I think that the youngest one was her, one of the boys in the picture was her father. So the Montague family goes back a long time in New Orleans. And she, so he married well, she married well, they were, uh, they had nine kids, and this is, I think this portrait is after she had had four or five of them, so he's probably exaggerating her waist a bit. But, <laughs> um, but she is very beautiful, and uh, we just acquired another image of her that we'll be unveiling hopefully soon. It's getting conserved, so we're excited about that, and uh, that needs to stay in this room. <laughs> um, and he also did the portrait of uh, Felix Grima's mother, Marianne Filiosa Grima, in 1832. This portrait is widely, if you go to any lecture about Amans, you'll, you'll see her because she's one of the ones that, um, she's really beautiful in person. So hopefully you will get to see her this afternoon. Let's see. So we have Lots of family objects, mostly furniture, um, other than the portraits, it's mostly furniture, but we do have some silver that I've pulled. I don't have these, these uh, forks and spoons out on the table right now because I'm figuring out how to, we, don't, we have all guided tours, but we don't have any stanchions up or anything. That's, that's something I feel strongly about not having the stanchions, but then you also have to worry about silver something somebody can easily just grab off the table. So. Um, I may be sewing some little, um, some little connectors onto there to protect them. But these are Felix Crema's, these are Felix Crema's um, silverware. You see the FG in the, on the back, and that's the French way, you know, doing the monogram on the back. And then we also have his caster. This is by, the, the silverware is by Laurent Labbé, who was working in Paris from 1829 to 1852. And we date these to 1829 to 1838 because of the mark. And these were, I just have to mention, these were a gift of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Grima Johnson. They also gave a lot to the Met of some of their other um, images and furniture that don't relate to our house. But Alfred Grima Johnson was this, I think he was a spy. Uh, Matt knows a little bit more about him too because he, he acquired the stuff from the, for the Met. But... Um, but he was fabulously wealthy and uh, was really generous. They donated a lot to us in 2010 after his death, and then in 96 they had donated a lot before he passed away. So we are grateful to the descendants. So this was, it's likely that this silver was exported to New Orleans and sold because the Creole clientele was really, their taste was leaning towards this French, uh, like Lydia showed some of those early early 19th century pieces from the, the immigrants from Haiti. So we also have a letter. The Grima family letters are in the, they're spread over three places. The collection here uh, upstairs, they've got two full record groups that are all Grima letters, and then Tulane has some and LSU has some. And here they've got letters from the family right before the Civil War, back and forth during the Civil War. The son, Victor Grima, was in medical school in Paris, and he stayed there during the Civil War. So I was trying to read one of the French letters the other day, but it's three pages handwritten, and he's pontificating about why he doesn't want to 
why he's not coming home. The family's trying to get him to come home during the Civil War. But um, in one of the letters that uh, Felix Grima writes to his friend Gustave Sabatier in 18, August 16th, 1864, he says, to sell the silver, and later you will sell my wife's piano, two paintings, and some diamonds. He requested that Sabatier send the money from the sale to an address in Paris, since, quote, these objects are useless today, and the price could still help pay Victor's expenses during his remaining time in France. Now, less than a week earlier, uh, Union General Nathaniel Banks had interviewed Grima, declared him an enemy of the United States, and demanded that he and his family leave Orleans Parish immediately. The family fled to Augusta, Georgia, where they would remain until the end of the war, and two of Felix's sons, Paul and Alfred, were in the Confederate Army, although Alfred was discharged in 1863 due to, due to a medical issue. We also have lots of Paul's letters, uh, well, the collection does, but the world has them, <laughs> in, um, and Paul writing from Petersburg, Virginia, where he was, for a lot of the, um, the Civil War. So there's, those are really enlightening and fun to read if you have time and ever wanna come back and take a look. I'd love to get those online at some point for kind of an online exhibit. Um, so we don't know if Sabatier ever followed his friend's wishes, but we're glad that at least the silver survived. We've got 10 of the forks and spoons, um, so. And then here's some more of the family objects. This is a bookcase around 1830. <clears throat> that belonged, about 40% of the objects in the house belonged to either the Hermans or the Grimas. The Grimas, the, most of the furniture was the Grima family and we have mostly only uh, portraits and documents from the Hermans. But at the left is a bookcase that belonged to the Grimas in the mid 19th century and is on display in Felix Grimas office library at the house so you'll definitely see that this afternoon the upper section has two glass doors the lower has a stationary door and a folding door when you visit the house you'll notice the difference between this one and then right on the other side of the doorway there's another one that has more of a, a um, empire aesthetic to it it's a little heavier and uh, most of the extant grima furniture is in the grecian plain or scroll style with little carving or decoration. So a lot of it looks similar to like the Barjan sofa that, that or day bed that Lydia showed you uh, with the scrolls. And the, that's like the, the drop leaf dining table here. This is actually two, two tables joined together to make one dining table. And we have a cloth on it now, but I'm showing you this picture and then we'll be able to lift up the tablecloth today and y'all can see it uh, close up. So. And take note of the American blown glass hurricane or smoke shades on the table. They're on display as well. And they're another one of my favorite objects. And I'm amazed that they still survive. They're like this big and it makes me really nervous every time I have to pick them up to change out the candles or anything. So, um, let's see. I apologize for this bad image here. I'm working on a lighting plan to get this room lit up a little bit more, but this is a day bed retailed by Francois Seigneure that was purchased by the uh, by uh, Philly, Marie Anne Filiosa Grima, who was the older lady. I showed you her portrait a minute ago. So um, let's see. So the receipt says one, it's all in French, Madame Veuve Grima, Veuve is widow. And that's how we know that this is the older, uh, Felix's mother instead of his wife because he was Felix was still alive at the time. So it says a uh, bois de lit de repos, uh, and that one is forty six dollars. And then another bois de lit à colonne à cajou. So I think we you'll see when you go to the house this bed behind here. We have actually there were six beds made for the Grimas, and they did have six sons. So. It's, you know, one idea that's been floated is those were done for the sons, but one of them, this is the larger one, and then we have two other of the smaller, more single, single size beds in our collection as well. So I'm not sure, but, uh, but it, it's likely that this, the uh, bed listed in this bill could be uh, this bed that's right next to it in the room. And there was also an armoire um, on Acaju, which is mahogany, of course, for $100. 
And so we don't know who made it, but we know Signore sold it. Lydia and I have gotten under that thing a few times and tried to figure out if there's any marks or anything, but we haven't been able to determine that. So, um, so those are a few of the things in the house. I'm not spending as much time on those because you guys are going to be visiting this afternoon and you'll have a lot more time to see it. But um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our house and kind of the idea of preserving the legacy of the families. So in the 1940s, the Women's Exchange, the historic buildings began attracting attention on its own, the building in its own right. And the first mention of this interest was made when a Mrs. Lowry, the house manager, reported taking in $3.40 from tourists viewing the house. And the courtyard and patio were first featured in the 1952 Spring Fiesta, which is an annual tour of French Quarter homes and gardens. If y'all um, come back in the spring, you could attend that. I, my grandmother used to dress up and stand in front of one of those in her antebellum <laughs> outfit. So in April 1960, the Herman Grima House was designated a city landmark by the Orleans Parish Landmarks Commission, and the members of the exchange weighed the usefulness of their current charitable work. They were set, they had this shop, which we still have the exchange shop now, but they were weighing, you know, is this the charitable work they were doing for women, um, or did they want to really focus on the preservation of the house? Now, the furnished rooms were in lower demand in the 1960s, and social changes gave women greater employment opportunities and more freedom, so they were able to go out and get their own apartments and they were more affordable and desirable. So, and, um, and then another act of God that kind of changed the, the direction of the house was that in 1965, Hurricane Betsy caused uh, 13, about $13,000 worth of damage, which today it had been uh, about 90,000, 90, so that's a lot of damage. And the roofs in the main house and the annex and to five of the rental rooms. So that prompted the board to refocus the mission on preservation and education. And they joined the new, this new movement Anne was talking about in the 19 teens was the beginning of it. And then in the 60s and 70s, there was another big wave of preservation in New Orleans. So they began the task of restoring the house. So this is the exchange shop around 1970. If you go there today, it's not nearly as full, but they used to take consignments of people trying to empty out grandmother's attic and things to, um, to make some money. And then on the right is a drawing by Claire Carruth of the courtyard, and that's the, the slave quarter building. Um, and that one was featured on some postcards and things and, and books. So let's see. And then, so they studied, they decided to get together with um, antique stealers. They used antique stealers, architectural historians, and uh, museum professionals. There's letters back and forth between a lot of the museum, house museums around the country for the women trying to do all this research to get the house started. So one of, uh, we do owe a credit of gratitude to the National Society of the Colonial Dames in the state of Louisiana because they were responsible for helping furnish the hall and parlor. And actually a lot of those pieces in the parlor and the hallway are still uh, on loan from the Colonial Dames from about 40 years ago. So the mission in support of preservation and education uh, about the architectural history of the Vieux Carré uh, led them to purchase the Gallier House in 1999. So we do, y'all will pass that on your walking tour. And that one dates to 1859 to 1860. So that was another one to interpret the mid 19th century life in New Orleans. And then we continue as most house museums do today, we have to stretch our boundaries and try to reach different audiences and provide as much programming to get as many people into the house as we can. So one of the things I was uh, mentioned earlier, this is an image in our hearth kitchen of two of our volunteer cooks who come every other Thursday from October to April and use the traditional uh, cooking methods. Uh, they use the hearth kitchen, they, the hearth uh, oven, they use these uh, stew holes and a spit where they um, they roast lamb and all kinds of things. It's, it's amazing. It smells so good. But since they're volunteers, we let them take all the food home. And so they feed their husbands that night with all this. So every once in a while, I'll get a little bite of pen perdu. But, but they use the Creole cookery cookbook from the women, that the Women's Exchange published in 1881. 
Um, so, and then on the right is an image of some of our kids from the courtyard camp. Our education director and myself got together and came up with some crafts for them to do. So they made fans and they made uh, collages and got to make hats and different things from um, that related to the time period. So there is a way to get little kids into house museums. You just have to be really careful and you have to designate specific objects that they're allowed to touch. So anyway, that's everything. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it.